Um, I want to thank you again for joining us, Emily. Um, welcome everyone to our distinguished visiting lecturer at Grand Rounds. Um, today we have uh, Dr. Emily Finn, who is a uh, neuroscience researcher who's recently taken a position at Dartmouth, um, but who uh, hails from Yale and from uh, uh, the uh, NIH. And I just want to tell you about how um, I became excited about Emily's work and uh, then happened to run into her at a meeting. So, and actually how, how the story starts is that we had been thinking uh, in the department, we had started thinking um, uh, over the last few years about this question of, you know, someday will we, be, will we have more biologically grounded um, methods, more neuroscientifically informed methods to, um, when we work with patients to assess uh, what's kind of going on with them, what are, what, forms of information processing dysfunction are particularly salient for them so we can fine tune our treatment approaches. And some of you who are here today may recall that we had Leanne Williams come and do a, a, a grand rounds I think many people found interesting and galvanizing. Uh, but this dialogue has continued among many of us in the department and we've been thinking about how, for example, do neuroimaging methods or EEG methods uh, enrich what we do as practicing clinicians. And then around that time, uh, it was actually Katie Cullen, um, who uh, is, is, I think everyone here knows, one of our child and adolescent psychiatrist researchers who circulated, um, Emily, your paper on this notion of fingerprints, um, of individual differences um, that can be reliably, um, in a sense, discerned um, when looking at um, fMRI uh, data um, from both resting state and, 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 and uh, from tasks and how this may uh, start to reveal important individual differences and essentially kind of brain, brain network um, connectivity and eventually perhaps in aspects of how brain networks are representing information and communicating among each other. And so that was circulated among a bunch of us and found it super exciting. And then I think later that year, I ran, I can't remember if I, I ran into you, I think I must have gone to one of your talks at, uh, was it ACNP? I honestly can't even remember the meeting, uh, or was it biological psychiatry? It would have been one of those. I think those. it was biological psychiatry, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I uh, thought, oh my God, what a wonderful opportunity to, to see this person, um, you know, kind of hear about her science firsthand. Um, and, and, and since then, we've continued to be interested in those questions. The department I've continued to um, be interested in the work that Emily is doing, and so wanted to invite her here. Um, as I mentioned, um, Emily um, did her um, uh, PhD work in neuroscience at Yale University and then went from there to um, NIMH, uh, where she was uh, doing a postdoc in the uh, uh, section on functional imaging methods. And I think, as I already mentioned, she just recently took a position um, at Dartmouth um, in, the, in their Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Um, and so um, hopefully the beginning of what will be an ongoing dialogue as you begin to refine and um, uh, really think through some of the very exciting and creative methods that you're developing to examine individual differences. Um, so I'd like to welcome you, Emily, and turn over the, uh, the talk to you. Um, Emily's gonna be talking about towards a stress test for the brain. Uh, well, thanks so much, Sophia, for that really nice introduction. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I, most of my work, pretty much all of my work so far has been in uh, looking at variability in healthy normative populations, but not for lack of trying to uh, collaborate with folks on the clinical side. So I'm very excited to uh, present what I've been thinking about and, and hear people's take on it. Uh, I know um, there's uh, mixed backgrounds in the audience, so hopefully uh, what I'm saying will be uh, appropriately targeted. I'm happy if there are like quick clarification questions, I'm happy to try to take those throughout or I'll, I'll try and... Um, you know, keep things uh, keep things somewhat accessible um, to multiple audiences. But let me go ahead and share my screen here. Can you guys see that? Okay, uh, great. So um, I like to start this talk with this quote from Plato, who wrote more than two thousand years ago: "No two persons are born exactly alike, but each differs from the other in natural endowments." one being suited for one occupation and the other for another. Um, so I think all of us that sort of live in society uh, have this um, intuition that, you know, no, no two people are, are the same and we all have our own strengths and weaknesses and idiosyncrasies. Uh, and just to get us on the same page, uh, when we talk about individual differences in, in psychology and I believe psychiatry as well, 
what we mean is ways that we're consistent in our own behavior across time and context while being reliably different from other people. Um, and so uh, if you believe, uh, or sorry, so if, um, so as Plato wrote, and as we sort of know from our own experience of living in the world, we, we're pretty confident that these differences are present in cognition and behavior. Uh, and so if you believe that processes of the mind are instantiated in the brain, then you should also believe that these differences are present in the brain. So the question uh, that's been driving my work is not so much whether these differences are present uh, because we believe they should be, but whether we can detect them using uh, the um, sort of limited non-invasive neuroimaging tools that we have available to us. And most of my work has uh, used functional MRI. Uh, of course, there's, there's other uh, modalities as well that, that could potentially get us even closer, but this is sort of um, uh, the best uh, tool that we have at the moment for, for non-invasively looking at spatiotemporal patterns of activity uh, in the human brain. And there's two main reasons that I think we should care about individual differences. Uh, the first one is, is sort of more on the, the basic science side. So I think that getting a handle on individual differences could help us deepen our understanding of cognition itself. So after about 30 years now of functional MRI, uh, we've gotten, I would say, a pretty good handle on, on what the general blueprint looks like uh, for various cognitive functions that we can think about. And these maps here, of working memory, language, and social cognition come from a meta-analysis with thousands of subjects. And uh, we sort of have these canonical uh, regions and networks of regions now that we associate with different functions. Uh, and this is pretty, you know, pretty consistent at a macro scale. But of course, we know that the individuals going into these maps, uh, the individual data might look uh, slightly different, or maybe in some cases, substantially different in different subjects as they perform these different tasks. And what this is telling us is that there's a degeneracy here in the sense that um, different individuals can perform the same function in different ways using uh, different spatiotemporal patterns of brain activity. And uh, this variability could be related to how people actually do on the task. Um, and it could be related to, uh, so we, we could see uh, linear relationships, for example, where you know more activity uh, is related to better performance. There could also be uh, nonlinear relationships potentially, but even holding performance constant, there could also be differences in people's cognitive strategies or styles that they're using to implement the task. Uh, and there could also, of course, be within subject changes, for example, with learning. Uh, and all of these sources of variability could map on to the brain activity patterns uh, in univariate ways and multivariate ways. They could map on to uh, brain activity, brain connectivity, or uh, several other features that we can extract from the data. Uh, and so my point here is that I think by, by drilling down into how individual brains perform individual cognitive functions, we can gain a more rigorous understanding, a sort of one-to-one -one mapping between uh, brain activity and, and cognition and behavior. The second reason to care about individual differences, and, and hopefully um, this will resonate with many of you, is that uh, as a non-clinical person, I believe that this uh, could give us some insight into mental illness. And so uh, if we think about uh, sort of the, the typical way that we as neuroimagers approached studying uh, populations with psychiatric illness, um, a, a lot of the work has been pretty categorical. So we could think about a trait that um, probably we, we believe exists on some kind of a spectrum in the population. So for example, trait anxiety. Uh, and um, you know, we might say that everybody is sort of in this tail end of the distribution is a patient uh, and everybody below that threshold is a control. And then when we do brain imaging studies, uh, in the traditional way, you know, we would tend to stratify people into these groups and, and look at some brain variable. And maybe we see that there's a, a mean difference between these groups, um, but we can also see that there's a lot of heterogeneity within each group. And so um, we'd like to sort of drill down further and, and characterize this heterogeneity. And so the approach that uh, I tend to take and is um, I'm not alone in this and I'm, I'm resting on the shoulders of giants here, but uh, is, is to move towards a more dimensional approach where we're treating these traits as the continuous spectra that we believe they are in many cases and uh, uh, performing continuous analyses where we're relating something about the brain um, in a parametric way to some kind of trait measure that we can extract about people. And even though my work thus far has mostly operated sort of in the more or less healthy normative range of this spectrum, I believe that by trying to parameterize this curve uh, in, in, in this part of the spectrum, it may help us get a handle on, on kind of what's going on uh, at those phenotypic extremes. And then the, the eventual hope with this, of course, as Sophia mentioned, would be that as we get a better handle on this and refine our models, it might help us develop translational tools that could be helpful in clinical 
or educational settings. So with those two goals in mind, I'll give you an outline of the talk today. Um, in the first section, I will ask and answer this question of, can we find individual differences in brain function that are robust and meaningful? And I'll, I'll say a bit more what I mean about robust and meaningful in this context. Uh, and then the second section, I'll talk about how brain state, so what we actually have people doing while they're in the scanner, can impact measurements of individual differences. And finally, in the last section, I'll talk about some of our uh, even more recent work looking at how we can deliberately manipulate brain state, and this is kind of what I mean by a stress test, uh, to draw out variation uh, along some phenotypic axis of interest. So getting started with this first section, uh, a lot of the work that I'll talk about in the first two thirds of the talk is um, the technique that we're gonna be using to analyze the fMRI data is functional connectivity. And I know many people are familiar with this, uh, but there's also a lot of flavors of functional connectivity analysis. So just to get us on the same page, the way that uh, I've typically done functional connectivity analysis is to start with a whole brain atlas that carves the brain up into, in this case, 268, nodes or parcels that cover the cortex, subcortex, and cerebellum. And then essentially for any given pair of these parcels, we can look at, uh, in this case, their bold activity time courses. So just um, as the person is in the scanner, we're, we're extracting signals from these different regions. And for a given pair of these regions, we can calculate the correlation between those signals to see how strongly they tend to fluctuate together. And if we do this for every pair of regions across the whole brain, we can construct these symmetric, uh, what we call functional connectivity matrices or functional connectivity profiles. And so essentially every element in this matrix is telling us how strongly uh, a given pair of regions tends to uh, activate or co-activate. Um, and so importantly, the, the, we're not necessarily getting directional information from this. So we're not necessarily saying that the red region is causing the blue region to activate or vice versa. We're simply observing that uh, their activity fluctuations tend to be somewhat synchronized. Uh, and so a lot of the early work with functional connectivity was, was looking at a group level uh, and, and looking at uh, sort of the, the general blueprint of network organization that's present in all individuals. Uh, but when we started this work a few years ago now, we were interested in how stable and how unique these functional connectivity profiles were within single individuals. And so to get at that, uh, we, in this first study, we were using data from the Human Connectome Project. Uh, at the time, there were only 126 uh, subjects in that study. I'm, I'm dating myself now. It's now up to about 1,200. But the, this initial study was using an early sample. Uh, these are healthy adults between 22 and 35 years old. Interestingly, uh, in this particular uh, early data set, there were 50 sets of twins. So in other words, 100 of the 126 people actually had a twin either mono or dizygotic in this data set, uh, which actually served to make our task harder. And I'll, I'll come to what our task actually was. But um, with the Human Connectome Project, people were scanned using fMRI in, uh, or across two different days of scanning. So on the first day, they had a resting state scan where they were just allowed to have their minds freely wander. They also did a working memory task and a, a motor uh, finger tapping task. And then they came in for a second day of scanning where they had a second resting scan and two additional tasks, uh, language and emotional face recognition. And in this first experiment, we asked the very simple question of, um, so we were able to calculate a functional connectivity matrix like I showed on the previous slide for all of the subjects in all of the scan conditions. And uh, we wanted to know how unique uh, and how stable are these profiles within individuals regardless of, of what they're doing. And so we asked if the simple question of can we match uh, a connectivity profile or a connectivity fingerprint, so to speak, from uh, one individual in one scan session to the same individual in another scan session. And so we tried all of the pairs of scans that were separated by at least a day. And uh, to make a long story short, we found a very high accuracy for this. So chance here is less than 1%, but we found that we were able to uh, accurately identify our fingerprint people with uh, between 54 and 94 percent accuracy depending on the pair of scans that was used and I'll come back to that variability later on but but overall um, this was surprisingly accurate uh, very surprising even to us um, since at that time the the sort of dominant thinking was that uh, a lot of the variance in the fMRI signal is dominated by what we're having people do while they're being scanned so you know we think of giving people a task a, as a way to modulate brain activity uh, but what this result suggested is that a lot of the variance in these activity patterns is actually accounted for by who you are uh, and not what you're doing during the scan, um, which uh, gave us some hope that they might be uh, useful biomarkers down the road. Uh, and when we look to see where in the brain most of this 
identifying or discriminating power was coming from, um, highlighting these two networks in purple and teal. These were sort of the uh, networks of um, higher order association regions in frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes. Um, so these are the areas that are most uh, evolutionary, evolutionarily recent. They've also been shown by other groups to have the most uh, both anatomical and functional variability across people. And it turned out that these networks were um, the best at identifying people, which, which makes some sense. Uh, now, um, the identification result was interesting uh, and, and surprising and encouraging, uh, but actually, if you think about a fingerprint, there's nothing biologically meaningful about the pattern of ridges and bumps on your fingertip, right? So in some ways, we wanted to know, uh, are, is there something meaningful embedded in these profiles, or are they simply sort of like barcodes where, you know, sure, everything is unique, um, but there's nothing, you know, truly meaningful uh, in those patterns. This is just sort of a random, um, sequence of numbers that just happens to be uh, unique uh, to each individual, or does, uh, does functional connectivity actually predict something meaningful about real world uh, brain output, which is behavior. And so again, in this initial study, um, as proof of concept, we looked to see if we could use functional co uh, connectivity profiles to predict this measure of fluid intelligence. So everyone in the data set completed this Raven's matrices task, uh, and there was a distribution of scores even in this healthy adult sample. And we developed a, a pretty simple machine learning technique to take in functional connectivity information from people's resting state scans, uh, build a model relating the strength and different connections to people's performance on this test, and then test that model in a held out subject to see how well we could predict their fluid intelligence score just from their resting state connectivity. Uh, and what we found, and, and here I'm plotting uh, the score that people actually got versus the score that our model predicted they would get. And um, we saw a statistical uh, significant accuracy in terms of how well we could predict fluid intelligence from whole brain uh, resting state connectivity, which, which was, uh, again, encouraging. And echoing the identification results, the bulk of the predictive power was coming from these networks that you might expect, so the, the higher order association regions. And so this was exciting to us because it suggests that not only are connectomes unique, they're also meaningful in the sense that we can use them to build models that predict real world behavior. Uh, since then, we've extended this approach to many other domains. Uh, so we've looked at how uh, functional connectome fingerprints can predict things like sustained attention and ADHD symptoms, uh, other cognitive abilities like reading ability, as well as symptoms of autism, and even things like personality traits and creativity. So. Um, as you'll see, none of these models are perfect. So I think we do have a little ways to go before uh, these are ready to be rolled out in any real world sense. But I think there's reason to be uh, encouraged that uh, this is an area that, that could eventually lead to some real world applications. Um, so to sum up this first section, uh, I believe we can now say that there are individual differences in brain function that are robust and meaningful. Robust in the sense that they can be uh, used to identify people from their patterns of brain connectivity and meaningful in, in the sense that uh, features of these patterns can actually be used to predict behavior. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll move on to section two. And, and um, one thing that some of you may be thinking uh, is, well, you know, if we can identify people regardless of what they're doing in the scanner and we can predict this sophisticated measure of cognitive ability, uh, fluid intelligence just from resting state connectivity, then does it really matter what we have people do while we're scanning them? Um, is, is rest enough? And I'm, I'm gonna argue um, no. <laughs> I'm gonna argue that uh, actually using brain state to tweak and enhance certain aspects of this variability can, can get us more sensitivity. And uh, to, to kind of walk you through a thought experiment that introduces this section of the talk, I'll ask you to look at these three individuals. Uh, I made this figure a little while ago and I will not be including our, our uh, more recent president in this, but um, let's say you have three individuals and they are all correlated with one another at some ground truth level of 0.5. So this is sort of the average similarity between these people. In this case, it's literally just uh, the correlation between the RGB values in these images. Uh, but let's imagine that this is a latent variable. We can't observe this directly. We have to put people into the scanner and have them do something as we measure their brain connectivity pattern. And so we have to choose what we have them do. And we can think about brain states or scan conditions that make people look more similar to one another uh, so, for example, we could um, sort of put them into a brain state that kind of blurs them out in a way and drives up the similarity across these images. 
and, and that's probably not what we want when we think about uh, studying individual differences. But uh, we could also think about brain states that make people look less similar to one another. Um, but in this case, we've, uh, we've done a manipulation that makes people look less similar to one another, but in a way that also makes them look less similar to themselves in a way. So we've actually destroyed uh, a lot of the meaningful information that, uh, that we can use to, to actually identify these people. So we've driven down similarity, but, but at what cost? And so um, I think there may be actually another axis to this space that's less about between subject similarity and more about this metric that I'm calling identifiability. And what I mean by that in this case is just how easy it is to look at a picture of one of these individuals and know who it is. Um, and so we could think about brain states or scan conditions that make people look less similar to one another in a way that makes them more identifiable. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I analogize it to this caricature condition here where we're kind of selectively emphasizing certain features of each person um, to make them less similar to one another and quote unquote more similar to themselves or more identifiable. And then uh, somewhat uh, paradoxically, I think, at least when you first think about it, is that we could also think about brain states that make people look more similar to one another, but also more identifiable. So um, see the analogy here would be you're, you're kind of blurring out some of the background information that doesn't matter as much in a way that's driving up overall similarity, but you're still leaving in and, and even emphasizing some of the features that make people uh, most similar to themselves or most identifiable. So. Uh, I introduced this, this um, thought experiment, so to speak, as a way to, to introduce this space that we'll be working in. So we'll be trying to place different tasks or brain states in this space in terms of what they do to the within subject and between subject variability. Uh, and so to get an initial handle on this question, we turn back to the HCP, the Human Connectome Project data, this time to an expanded sample. And uh, what you're seeing here is that brain state or task condition does in fact affect between subject similarity. So that horizontal axis from the previous slide. Uh, and this graph here is showing on the X axis, the nine different scan conditions or tasks. So uh, we have our two resting state runs as well as seven different uh, cognitive tasks that people were asked to do. And then these distributions are showing uh, all of the pairwise similarity values for how similar if we think about a functional connectome uh, functional co connectivity fingerprint from each person within that condition, how similar are those uh, connectivity fingerprints uh, across individuals? And so these distributions are really wide because this is pairwise. I think there's like more than 700,000 values going into each of these distributions, but you can start to see some uh, interesting trends. So for example, uh, down here on the right-hand side associated with some of the least between subject similarity are the two resting state scans, as well as the motor task, which was a simple finger tapping task uh, that probably allowed for a lot of mind wandering during it as well. And so this, uh, this makes some sense. You think about people are kind of mind wandering. They're probably doing really different things from one another or potentially doing different things from one another. And these are the states that are associated with the least between subject similarity. Whereas over here on the left-hand side, the state that was associated with the most between subject similarity was this relational matching task. So this was a demanding cognitive task um, where people were probably uh, in, in a more similar state. Uh, and so this, this makes some sense. It's kind of a good proof of concept that we can manipulate how similar subjects look to one another using different tasks. Uh, but as I mentioned, maybe the axis that we care more about rather than similarity is this axis of identifiability. And so to look at that, we replicated our fingerprinting or our, our identif identification experiments, this time with an expanded set of data. Um, so chance here is, is uh, very low. So, uh, and the way to uh, read this matrix here is essentially, um, uh, so, so this cell here, for example, would be trying to match the working memory matrix from day one to the resting matrix from day one. And so essentially we tried all uh, possible pairs of matching across scan conditions. And uh, what I'd like you to notice in this matrix is, is mostly that there's a lot of variability here. So depending on the specific pair of scans, uh, there's, there can be really different accuracies in terms of how well we're able to identify people. And some of the interesting things that I noticed in this matrix, so for, uh, for one thing, the resting state, uh, so the, these two squares here are matching resting on day one to resting on day two. So theoretically, this is the same scan condition both times. Um, and we're still doing pretty well. Again, this is a larger sample and we've actually cut down the amount of data we're using um, to make it commensurate across tasks. This is based on only about four minutes of data. So even with four minutes of resting data, we can still uh, identify people with about 70% accuracy, which is pretty high. 
uh, but it's not as high as accuracy between certain pairs of tasks. So for example, if we try to match people uh, from the working memory run on day one to the relational matching run on day two, we actually get 83% accuracy, even though uh, theoretically those are two different tasks, whereas rest is the same state. Um, we know rest tends to be pretty unconstrained. And so I, I found it interesting that um, at least numerically, sometimes we get even better accuracy between uh, a pair of, of different tasks than between rest. And we wanted to uh, then relate uh, these, these two axes. So the sort of the similarity axis and the identifiability axis. And so here in this plot, I'm showing you the mean between subject correlation or the mean between subject similarity. So that's just the, the mean of those box plots that I showed on the previous slide. So on average, how similar do subjects look to one another in a given task condition? And I'm plotting that against uh, what we're calling the mean database ID rate. And what that is, is just on average, how well does that task condition do for identification? So when paired with all other tasks, how easy is it for us to identify people in that brain state? Uh, and there's only nine um, conditions here, but what you can see is, is a pretty convincing positive correlation between these two things. And uh, to give you an intuition for what that means, what, what this is telling us is that states or tasks that make subjects look more similar to one another actually make better databases for identification. Uh, and that was really interesting to us uh, and potentially went against uh, what we might have thought a priori. So a priori you might think that sort of pulling people apart and making them look less similar would make them more identifiable. Uh, but we're actually in, in some ways seeing the opposite. And so if we bring back uh, our theoretical space here, we can think of uh, perhaps these three conditions in the upper right that were associated with both high uh, between subject similarity and high identifiability. They happen to be the emotional faces, gambling and relational matching task. These quadrants we can think of as falling kind of in the upper right hand quad or sorry, these tasks we can think of as falling in the upper right hand quadrant of this space. So uh, they make subjects look more similar, but in a way that actually makes them more identifiable. Um, and the, the way that I kind of uh, interpret this is we're we are constraining a certain amount of the variability, but in a way that makes the remaining variability more stable and more meaningful. So kind of by having some sort of task on board, we're stabilizing that functional architecture in a way that pulls everybody together uh, in, in, in terms of um, maybe getting rid of some of the extraneous noise or, or the state level stuff, but in a way that's still preserving or even enhancing uh, the, the trait level aspects of these connectivity profiles. Uh, but in my mind, uh, identification is sort of only one step along the chain. So what we also want to know is how well can we predict behavior from uh, data acquired during these different task states. And so to look at that, uh, we again, um, we turn back to our uh, connectome based predictive models and this time we're varying the input to the model. So in, in the first uh, uh, instantiation, I just showed you resting state connectivity being used to predict fluid intelligence, which we could do with some degree of accuracy. Here, we're trying data from all different nine scan conditions. So that's along this axis here, uh, the connectivity data that's getting input into our model. And then uh, we're using that to predict three different measures of cognitive behavior. So this is the fluid intelligence measure I talked about previously. We also had a verbal IQ measure and also um, a working memory task done outside the scanner. And so, um, Basically, the more yellow these cells, uh, the better data from that condition could predict one of these behaviors. And uh, what I'd like to, what I'd like you to notice here is that even though all of these predictions were uh, technically statistically significant, the two resting state runs actually do the worst across the board for predicting uh, cognitive behavior. Uh, and basically, any task, like so, for example, even a really simple motor finger tapping task, we're getting a better prediction of um, this high-level cognitive ability, fluid intelligence, than we are from resting state. And the tasks, at least in this data set, uh, that tended to do the best for these behaviors were the working memory and the language tasks. And if we look at where those tasks fell kind of in, in our um, space over here, we're seeing that these are kind of associated with being somewhere in the middle on these similarity and identifiability axes. So um, suggesting that some level of, of constraint uh, is helpful, uh, but then still allowing for some of that cognitive variability to emerge um, which then gives us the features that are more sensitive to be able to predict these out of scanner behaviors. Um, so at this point, I started to get really interested in naturalistic conditions. And uh, what we mean by that in, in the human neuroimaging world usually is things like watching movies or listening to stories. So these are tasks that um, have been used in, in some really beautiful work over the last uh, 
15 years or so showing that people as they watch the same movie in the scanner will have very similar patterns of brain activity. So movies can actually synchronize activity across people uh, in really strong and interesting ways. And, and we thought that this would be a really interesting test uh, sort of boundary condition for our identification experiments because if uh, movie watching activity is really similar across people, it should be harder for us to identify them based on their functional connectivity as they watch movies. So to uh, start to look at this, we had a, a data set in collaboration with Tammy Vanderwall at Yale where she had scanned, uh, again, healthy young adults, 34 of them during movie watching paradigm. So they, she had two different sessions where people uh, did a resting run. They also had this uh, InScapes movie, which if you're not familiar with it, it's um, kind of a fun, uh, it was developed initially actually for compliance in pediatric populations during scanning, but it's this very abstract um, uh, movie essentially that was the, uh, that was made. And then she also had a clip from Ocean's Eleven. So this is a very uh, fast paced kind of Hollywood, very different flavor of movie from, from the InScapes movie. Uh, but she had everybody come back for two sessions where they did each of these three runs. And we, uh, to make a long story short, uh, tried our functional connectivity experiments or sorry, our, our fingerprinting experiments using this data set. And uh, here again is sort of the, our ability to match people across different pairs of scans. And if you look down the diagonal here, you can see that um, our, our accuracy is still quite high. Um, and so uh, along the diagonal is between pairs of matched conditions, so REST1 to REST2, Inscapes1 to Inscapes2, and Oceans1 to Oceans2. Um, and so we're doing quite well between the same condition. Uh, if anything, uh, numerically, actually we're doing better in the movie conditions than in rest. Uh, so we're better able to identify people as they as they watch movies. Um, but the off diagonal elements are also quite high, suggesting that there is a lot of stability in the functional connectome between rest and these movie watching states and that movie watching doesn't actually saturate this individual variability, but it actually preserves our ability to identify people even as uh, theoretically it, it, it brings people um, closer together in, in some way. So this was an encouraging uh, proof of concept that we might be able to use these naturalistic scan conditions to tap into uh, certain brain systems that might be more, even more relevant uh, to trait level phenotypic information. And so with that in mind, uh, we turned back to the Human Connectome Project, this time to their 70 data set, which actually was collected at University of Minnesota. Um, and this was a subset of the data that, um, of, of the subjects that were scanned at 3T. This was 176 healthy young adults. And uh, they came up to uh, Minnesota for a 7T scan where they uh, had, um, it was a lot of scanning actually. So it was like two or three days of scanning. Uh, and basically there were resting state runs. This was all at 70 this time, um, resting state runs and two different uh, movie scans on each day for a total of four movie watching scans. And the important thing to know about the movie scans is that they were comprised of uh, individual clips. So it's like three to four minute clips that were uh, separated by about 20 seconds of rest. And so each movie had a different set of clips. Uh, and we wanted to see how well we could use movies to predict uh, traits, essentially. And we wanted to pit movies against rest uh, to see which did better in terms of trait level predictions. And so the targets of prediction that we used in this study were kind of a summary measure of people's cognitive ability and a summary measure of people's socioaffective traits from the NIH Emotion Toolbox. So those were two separate scores that we were trying to predict and we're, we're varying the input to our model from resting state uh, to movie watching data. And so we, what we found uh, was that movie watching did indeed outperform rest for predicting behavior. Uh, and so in these graphs here, um, we are running our model now multiple times. Um, so the dots in purple come from uh, movie watching runs and the dots in dark gray come from re uh, resting state runs. And this here is the, the correlation between observed and predicted behavior. So essentially how accurate was the model. And these are all compared to null distributions shown in light gray. Um, and so what you can see particularly in this session one data, um, both of the movie runs outperformed the rest run. And in fact, movie two uh, seemed to be very, very good at predicting cognitive ability. Uh, and the same trend held in session two, although uh, results were overall weaker. I think this data was a little bit less um, high quality because people had been in the scanner for like several days at that point, <laughs> but, but similar trends in session two. Uh, and then we, when we looked uh, at the socioaffective tendency uh, trait score, uh, again, we saw a similar trend. So this score was harder to predict in general, 
Um, and one thing to note is that uh, this uh, score was based on self-report, whereas the cognitive ability was based on uh, behavioral task performance. Uh, but to the extent that any run could predict this socioaffective tendency score, uh, only movie one gave us successful predictions of that score. Um, and actually none of the runs in session two were able to predict that score. Um, but overall, this is uh, showing us at least some evidence that, that movie watching actually increases sensitivity to behavioral differences over resting state. And to unpack this a little bit further, uh, I mentioned that each of these movie runs was comprised of individual three to four minute clips. And so we went back and calculated functional connectivity from each of the clips separately to see how well each clip in turn could perform for predicting, uh, in this case, our, our cognitive summary score. Um, and so these are the four movie runs uh, in these graphs here. And then on the x-axis are the different clips. Um, some of these came from uh, kind of uh, independent or documentary style films. Those were the ones in movies one and three. Uh, the clips in movies two and four, you, you may recognize. Uh, so there were clips from Inception, The Social Network, Ocean's Eleven, as well as Home Alone, Aaron Brockovich, and one of the Star Wars movies that I can never remember. <laughs> I always feel bad for forgetting. Um, but essentially, the, these were uh, there was some variability uh, in in the clip content, um, and in turn, we saw some some pretty interesting variability in how individual clips performed for predicting cognition. So, in particular, you can see uh, two of these clips in movie two, which came from the Social Network and Ocean's Eleven. Uh, kind of did uh, outsize uh, uh, really well at uh, predicting cognition, whereas some of the clips were not, we were not able to get a significant prediction of cognition at all. And these are all length matched. Um, so same duration, but just different content can give us uh, really different prediction, predictive power. Uh, and these are the same uh, analyses for the emotion trait score. So again, this one was harder overall to predict. Uh, but three clips uh, did actually give us a significant prediction of uh, emotional traits. Um, again, the Social Network and Ocean's Eleven clips uh, did well for this, and, and also this um, documentary style clip in, in movie one. Um, so this was really interesting. We wanted to kind of unpack, you know, what it was about these clips that might be leading to these differences in predictive ability. And one thing we, we noticed kind of right off the bat was that um, what we thought clips with higher social content were doing better for prediction. And we quantified this by uh, extracting a sort of index of the social content of a clip. So here we're plotting on the x-axis the number of TRs or the number of frames um, containing at least one face. So a sort of a proxy for social content is how what percentage of the time faces are on the screen during the clip against that clip's prediction accuracy. And uh, again, we see a positive relationship here such that clips with higher social content, and here I'm just showing you some still images from these clips, were associated with better prediction of cognitive ability. Uh, and down here, the clips with very little social content, these tended to be kind of um, uh, sort of independent films with uh, kind of nature montages and other scenes that didn't really involve a lot of humans. Um, and this is interesting because again, we're looking at cognitive ability here. So it's not necessarily a, a social measure that we're trying to predict, but still somehow the social clips, um, as you might imagine, are, are maybe just kind of more engaging or they're kind of, um, they're, or at least they're engaging the brain circuits in different ways uh, in a way that's somehow enhancing our ability to predict uh, this, this cognitive score. Um, and uh, one thing we were interested in looking at here was sort of, is this, kind of an overall attention effect. So in other words, um, are people just more engaged in the social content? Are they, uh, is it just somehow sort of a better driver of ongoing cognition? Um, and therefore, you know, we, we just see more arousal and more engagement. I, I should mention too, um, I didn't put these figures in here, but we, we did a lot of um, controls to try to rule out any differences in overall data quality driving these effects. So we didn't actually see um, differences. We didn't see too many differences in things like head motion or, um, or uh, uh, like basically how if arousal state as measured by different eye tracking measures. So um, we're pretty confident that this result isn't just driven by, for example, people being more likely to be asleep at rest than during movies, for example. We're, we're pretty confident that it's driven by um, some actual tweak going on uh, with, with ongoing cognition. But one interesting thing that we had in this data uh, was the, the eye tracking measure. So there was simultaneous eye tracking performed as people watched the movies. And so we loosely hypothesized that uh, maybe the clips that 
are evoking just stronger, stronger overall attention and engagement would also synchronize people's eye movements. So we could sort of use synchrony of eye gaze as a proxy for how much people are engaged in the clip. So if a clip is really engaging, you know, people should kind of be looking at, at similar things perhaps. And so we were able to calculate this measure of eye tracking ISC or eye tracking intersubject correlation. So in other words, just how synchronized are people's uh, eye gaze trajectories over the course of a clip. And we can calculate that sort of for all different pairs of subjects. And then we can extract kind of a, a median of the distributions so sort of, uh, in other words, on average, how synchronized do, do eye movements tend to be in each clip. And uh, somewhat contrary to our initial hypothesis, we didn't see a relationship between median gaze synchrony and prediction accuracy. So in other words, um, it wasn't necessarily the case that the clips that more strongly synchronized eye movements across people uh, better predicted behavior. So there, there wasn't a strong relationship there. However, uh, there was a relationship between uh, the standard deviation of the synchrony across people and how well a clip did for predicting cognition. So in other words, uh, clips where certain pairs of people are quite synchronized in their uh, gaze trajectory, but not other pairs of people. Those were the clips that were uh, did best for prediction. So uh, I guess one way to interpret this would be that um, clips that engage people in different ways are are the best uh, sort of best draw out this individual variability that allows us to predict this again this cognitive measure I'm just checking on time quickly here um so uh overall with that data set um you know we didn't choose the clips ourselves so there was uh we were sort of limited in, in how we could, um, the clips weren't necessarily selected to cover a principled space of, of different content and things like that. But I think we're seeing some uh, initial uh, evidence that uh, the, the clip content does actually matter um, for, for how well we can predict individual differences. And so to sum up this second section, uh, we've seen that brain state does in fact impact measurements of individual differences. Rest is probably not the optimal state in many cases. Uh, and we're seeing evidence that cognitive tasks and especially naturalistic tasks can uh, kind of stabilize functional architecture in a way that allows us to better predict behavior. Um, and again, these naturalistic tasks are, are particularly intriguing candidates, at least for me. So uh, with the remaining time, I'll talk a bit about uh, carrying forward this idea of naturalistic tasks as a way to manipulate brain state to draw out a uh, variation of interest. So. Um, thinking of sort of bespoke scan conditions that we can create uh, to target certain phenotypes. And uh, the one I started with was trait paranoia. So this, this is an interesting one. I, I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience uh, that trait paranoia is um, relevant uh, for, for many uh, psychiatric illnesses, uh, particularly the psychosis spectrum, uh, but it also interestingly varies even in a, in a normative population. And so just as a a sort of proof of concept study, we uh, developed a, a social narrative that was deliberately ambiguous. So we actually created our own story. Uh, and the story was about a physician, an American physician that travels down to rural Peru and treats villagers at a clinic there. And there's sort of a series of things that happen that kind of, um, some things are positive, some things are neutral, other things kind of make you feel like she was maybe lured there under false pretenses. And the story kind of ends, um, at a climax with, without really a resolution. And the idea is that different people will hear the story. So everyone hears the exact same story, but uh, people with different levels of trait paranoia might get a different read on the story. So some people might get a more suspicious read and other people um, might think that the events were again, neutral or, or even positive. Uh, and so in this study, we had people do several basic cognitive tasks as well as self-report scales, including trait paranoia. Um, but kind of buried in several other scales because we wanted to avoid them guessing the purpose of the study. And then we brought them back about a week later and they did an fMRI scan where they listened to an auditory recording of the story. Again, everyone hears the exact same story, but the idea is that different people will form different interpretations and reactions. And moving away a little bit from functional connectivity, I think one of the really uh, fun and powerful things about naturalistic stimuli is that they allow us to do this method of intersubject correlation. And what this means essentially is that uh, as two people or two brains are exposed to the same movie or story over time, if we correlate uh, patterns of activity in the same spatial region across people and we see uh, a strong correlation there, we can infer that that region is somehow responding uh, reliably to the stimulus or somehow involved in processing the stimulus given uh, this time-locked activity across subjects. 
Um, and this was a method pioneered by Uri Hassan's lab. And we're extending this a little bit here to ask not just what's synchronized or what's common in everybody, but rather what might be more common uh, or more reliable in certain groups of subjects than others. Here, uh, groupings related to trait paranoia. And uh, right, so, so does this ISC or this intersubject correlation uh, metric vary with people's trait paranoia? Uh, so before I show you the paranoia results, I'll just show you intersubject correlation across the whole sample. So this map here is how synchronized uh, different parts of the brain were as people listen to the story. And, and uh, this is echoing um, lots of other results using these types of stimuli. You can see happily, because this is an auditory story, we're seeing some of the highest synchrony in primary auditory regions. Uh, but we're also interestingly seeing uh, a peak of synchrony in the temporal parietal junction. And if you do a meta-analysis for terms associated with this region, you get things like theory of mind and mentalizing. We're also seeing a peak of synchrony down here in the cerebellum, which is associated with similar uh, functions. And so this was sort of an initial clue. Again, this is across the whole sample, so no stratification according to trait paranoia. But this was an initial clue that our task was doing what we hoped it might, so prompting people to think about uh, these types of social interactions and, and engage in theory of mind processes. Um, and so the next thing we did was we, we actually stratified people into groups, uh, high paranoia and low paranoia, and we looked uh, to see if there were differences in synchrony or differences in stereotyped responses between these different groups. And so we took a whole brain approach to this, um, and there were uh, some, some regions, some small regions, but they popped out and they survived correction. So uh, we saw, and these were all in the direction of more synchrony in the high paranoia group than the low paranoia group. And so I'm showing you the name of the region and then also the four uh, top meta-analysis terms associated with that region underneath. So uh, the left temporal pole emerged as well as the right medial PFC, a uh, region dorsal to that in the right dorsal medial PFC and the region in the left percunius. Um, and again, these were all more synchronized in people with high trait paranoia. So a pair of two high participants versus a pair of two low participants. And um, I should also say here, we were pretty careful to rule out uh, differences in overall attention. So both the high and the low groups were equal in their memory performance on comprehension questions. There was no difference in age or uh, sex breakdown between the groups. Uh, we did a number of other things to try to rule out other uh, trait level differences. Uh, so we're pretty confident that this, these differences are uh, due somewhat uh, in part to uh, the sort of baseline paranoia that people bring with them to the story, uh, causing differences in, in these stereotyped patterns of activity. Uh, and I'm gonna skip through this for reasons of time. Um, but one uh, really interesting thing about uh, naturalistic stimuli then with this intersubject correlation measure is you can then go back to the stimulus itself and try to ask what in the story was actually driving peaks of, peaks of activity in these regions that were identified with the ISC analysis. And so to do that, um, because we had created the narrative, narrative ourselves, uh, we had inserted uh, you know, certain events that we hoped would provoke, or that we believed would provoke suspicion. And these were sort of, um, we're calling these mentalizing events as a shorthand, but essentially these were times when the main character was experiencing an ambiguous social interaction or explicitly mentalizing about the intentions of other characters. And so we had a series of independent raters go through and mark these events and we got kind of a consensus for them. And then we were able to create a regressor based on these events essentially. And um, these are just uh, two examples of, of sentences that might be socially ambiguous or mentalizing versus uh, non-mentalizing or neutral. Um, and we took this uh, model essentially back to the brain data and we did this in a hypothesis driven way. So we had our two regions that emerged as more synchronized in the high paranoia group. And these were the regions that were uh, more closely related to social processing based on previous work. So the left temporal pole and the right medial PFC uh, which you'll recall were more synchronized in the high paranoia group than the low paranoia group. And we hypothesized that part of the synchrony would be driven by a stronger response to these mentalizing events in the high group than the low group. Uh, we also had two control regions, one positive control here in sort of the temporal parietal junction or the PSTS. If you recall from the first ISC map, this was a region that was strongly synchronized in everybody, but didn't show a group difference. And so we hypothesized that this region would respond strongly to these mentalizing events in everybody, but again, no, no group difference. And finally, we had a negative control uh, here in the primary auditory cortex. So this region should not respond preferentially to these events in either group. And overall, that's basically exactly what we saw. So we saw that in both the left temporal pole and the right medial PFC, 
um, the, the beta coefficients from this regression were higher for the high paranoia group. So there's more reactivity in these regions to these events in the left temporal pole and right medial PFC. In the left uh, PSTS, there was uh, strong reactivity in both groups, but no group difference. And then finally, in uh, left Heschel's gyrus, there was no reactivity in either group. So uh, this was some exciting traction that we were able to get on, you know, not just where in the brain these differences are arising, but why. So which events in the story are, might actually be driving um, increased sensitivity or increased reactivity in people that come in with a higher level of trade paranoia. Um, and uh, again, for reasons of time, I'll kind of briefly. I'm happy to go through this um, in more depth if people are interested. Uh, but we also had a behavioral measure based on this story where we had people do a free recall task right after the story. Uh, and we were able to perform some automated text analysis on that to show that patterns of speech in response to the story also relate to trait paranoia. So there were certain features that were more common um, in people's recall transcripts in the high paranoia group versus the low paranoia group. Um, and our, our next steps with this that have been somewhat derailed by COVID, <laughs> but our, our next steps with this, uh, I've collected a, a data set here um, showing you these are four uh, short films that uh, these time th these were sort of selected to be relevant to uh, this time more of a depression or mood disorder axis. So three of them, these three on the left here have a lot of social content. One of them is a purely mechanical control. So it's just a Rube Goldberg machine with no people or social information, but it still has a, a trajectory, albeit a mechanical rather than a social one. And one of the things we're really interested to do with this data set is, um, uh, well, first of all, look at differences in the films in terms of which film best pulls out differences related to symptoms of mood disorders. So uh, kind of a hypothesis driven way to investigate uh, the differences in social content, but also with the films, uh, we can look uh, along different places in the processing hierarchy to see where these differences start to emerge. So uh, the really cool thing about movies is we have sort of this bundle of features that all kind of come for free. So we have low level audiovisual information like loudness uh, and frequency in the audio domain and luminance and flow in the visual domain. We have kind of mid-level semantic categories like faces and houses uh, that we know have fairly stereotyped responses in the brain. And finally, we have really high level features, things like language, emotional tone, affect, um, you know, narrative arcs, lots of different things like that. And so one hypothesis might be that uh, down here on the, the low level feature end, um, this is simulated data. I wish the real data were this pretty, <laughs> but one uh, potential outcome could be that um, the response to these low level features. So you can imagine this black time course is kind of a mean and then there's individual variation around that mean and gray. Uh, so it's possible that uh, individuals are largely uh, similar in their response to the low level features, but as you kind of move up the chain to these higher level sort of lower frequency features, you might sort of see more variability um, in, uh, in individual processing. Um, and of course, this doesn't have to choose. We could actually see individual variability down here in the low level side and maybe uh, in um, conditions like autism, you know, that might be a reasonable thing to hypothesize, but I think there's a lot of promise here. Uh, in using different um, and sort of linking variability or pinning variability to different rungs on the processing hierarchy, so to speak. Uh, and movies really allow you to, to get at that pretty nicely. Um, so I'll end there to make sure to leave enough time for questions. But in conclusion, uh, I believe at this point that we can, we can find robust and meaningful individual differences in brain function uh, in the sense that we can identify people from their patterns of brain connectivity and we can use functional connectivity to predict behavior. Um, at the same time, brain state uh, can have a strong impact on the individual differences that we measure. And so I, I like to think of this uh, the analogy to like a clinical stress test. So um, we might get more bang for our buck by moving away from rest a little bit, at least in populations that can handle it, and using cognitive tasks uh, to really enhance the variability that we care about. Um, and then in this initial proof of concept study where we were directly manipulating brain state to draw out variation, uh, we saw that we were able to evoke differences along this paranoia axis using an ambiguous social narrative. And as I mentioned, we're, we're carrying this forward uh, to different types of stimuli in different populations um, and continuing to examine these questions. So with that, I will uh, thank you all for your attention as well as collaborators, uh, both at NIMH and at Yale um, and my new lab at Dartmouth my funding sources, and then I will leave you with this uh, final image of the dangers of averaging across the subjects. Uh, and I'd love to take any questions. 
Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Wonderful presentation. Super exciting, again, for those of us who think about individual differences um, in, in clinical settings. Um, I know we've already got, uh, so uh, please feel free to um, place questions in the uh, chat and uh, I'll be um, uh, kind of moderating those. So our first question is from uh, Ziad Nahas, who's a uh, depression researcher, and he's asking what might the effect of mood at a time of scanning, say depressed versus euthymic, be on within individual similarities on resting states? And I would assume also within task-based uh, uh, task based measures, would you predict that resting state uh, would be better or worse to demonstrate individual differences as opposed to a particular task? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and something that I think we, we have some work to do on the movie side, at least, is, is understanding uh, kind of what happens with repeat presentations. <laughs> so actually one, one area where the, uh, the movie watching thing it, it might not be perfect, or it, I won't say it's not well suited, but I think we need to think more about how best to do it. So you know, the experience of watching a movie twice is not this, you know, the second experience is, is, is distinct in many ways. I mean, you have now um, memory, you have anticipation effects, you have things like that. You might be paying less attention, you might be paying more attention. Um, a lot of that kind of depends. And so I think, um, you know, this question is, is getting at within subject variability, which is also a really important component, um, especially in, in, in psychiatric illness. And so I think, uh, mood could absolutely have an impact on, on these things. I think um, with movies, you are, you're kind of able, so, you know, assuming you can get a reliable behavioral measure of mood as well, um, movies afford you the opportunity to um, link some of that within subject variability to, to this, this ground truth time course of, you know, not just what's different between different moods in the brain, but, but maybe why, maybe get, getting closer to why. Um, I think uh, with resting state, you know, it's uh, certainly we've learned a lot from it, but I, I think that there are just so many things that are are unconstrained um, that it can it can sometimes limit our ability to kind of peg variability that that we care about, you know, to specific features. And so um, I think uh, I'm I'm trying to remember off the top of my head if I know I know. Um, Argiris Stringaris's group at NIMH has done some really interesting work looking at mood, um, even just looking at mood over the course of a resting state scan. So his group has some evidence. I mean, so resting state, if anyone's ever been a participant, um, it's pretty boring, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> and so yeah, he's actually been able to show that even in healthy individuals, mood will actually decline over the course of a resting scan. Um, and that's sort of interesting thing. And of course he thinks a lot about um, to what this might be doing in, in um, in populations with mood disorder. So I think it's safe to say there's definitely effects, there, there would definitely be effects of mood in resting state connectivity, um, but it's it can be, in my mind, a lot harder to parse out what those effects really are and sort of pin them unequiv unequivocally to mood as opposed to you know, other factors that might be happening. I think with the movies, um, you know, maybe one answer is to sort of have a set of clips that are tend to evoke similar moods so that you don't have to show the exact same clip twice, but you can kind of use different exemplars and, and sort of abstract away from the specific content. Um, but still, uh, well, yeah, extract, like find features that you can extract from different clips and sort of abstract away from the specifics of the exact clip to sort of um, get a little more of an interpretable picture of how mood is impacting functional connectivity. Um, I think there's also a lot of potential in combining resting state and movie approaches. Um, so I think it's early days, but um, yeah. yeah. It's kind of, it's one of those fields where one wants to sort of say, go faster, go faster, because this undoubtedly, you know, uh, may, may uh, be able to be eventually be applied, right? Uh, there's another question from um, Michael Paul Shalmo, um, an fMRI researcher with expertise, particularly in visual um, pro processing throughout the visual hierarchy. He's asking for uh, fMRI measures of connectivity during tasks. I'm wondering if you've thought about how connectivity changes dynamically between different task conditions and whether this might be helpful for understanding brain behavior relationships. Um, so I think he's saying whether you've looked at this at all, and then he's clarifying that is to say different conditions within sing a single task. Okay, yeah. So for example, like um, like in a working memory task, like between a one back and a two back, maybe is is that a fair? Or like with an emotional faces task, like positive versus negative emotions or things like that. Um, 
Yeah, I think there's, uh, so one thing we, we noticed certainly in the original fingerprinting paper, which I didn't talk about today, but, um, and in my PhD lab, Todd Constable's lab has done a lot of nice work following up on this. Um, I, it's safe to say that combining data for multiple tasks as well as rest um, does get us a lot closer to, so if, if we sort of give our algorithm three different matrices, you know, from, from two different task conditions and rest, for example, we can get accuracy basically 100%. So we're kind of at ceiling. So having sort of, I, I think of it as like different views, like, like different, even like photo orientations, you know, if you're trying to get a handle on what someone looks like, you know, you can kind of see their face straight on, you can see a profile, you can see a three quarters view. So like sort of different lenses, um, uh, absolutely help us characterize people. Um, I think what you're asking here is a more subtle, but also more interesting question about sort of how the reorganization between different task states or within, uh, you know, a similar task, but across different parametric levels or something else that we're varying. Uh, and um, I haven't looked at that directly, actually, uh, mostly because I've gotten more into these movie tasks where it's hard to sort of claim any kind of parametric modulation of anything. But um, there's definitely been a lot of work. And my sense of that literature, though, is that there's some conflicting evidence. I think some groups have found that, for example, the more a brain reorganizes between rest and task, the better the person is at performing that task. But then in other uh, cases, it seems to be that the less you reorganize from rest to tasks, in other words, the more your resting brain looks like your task brain, the better you are at the task. And the interpretation of that would be like, you know, if you're sort of intrinsically set up, ready to go, <laughs> even at rest, you know, then maybe you do. So, you know, I, I think um, both could be true <laughs> depending on the task that you're looking at, depending on the behavior. And that's really where, you know, things get complicated. Is I don't think there's gonna be a one size fits all answer to a lot of these questions. Um, but yeah, long story short, I haven't looked at that too much personally, um, but there's a lot of good work out there um, by other groups. Uh, actually, the one other relevant thing I'll say, um, since this was a fun clinical collaboration I did with uh, Wanling, Wanling Singh and Ellen Liven left at NIMH, they had data from a pediatric uh, irritability study, and they had um, different blocks of a task where they were manipulating feedback to be frustrating or non-frustrating. <laughs> and uh, we actually found that we were better able to predict uh, affect, affective reactivity from the frustrating blocks um, than the non-frustrating blocks. And we also tried the difference between those two, but it seemed like it was mostly just driven by just the frustrating block itself. Um, so very preliminary answer, but I think uh, will be important for future work. Great. Another question from Igor Levchenko, um, who's thanking you for an amazing presentation. It says, uh, looks like most of the shared response uh, measured using an ISC method can be explained by presence of low level features in the movie uh, story, loudness or luminance, for example. How do you think it is possible to control these features? For example, subtract them out somehow in order to focus on more high level features like emotions or, or something else? Yeah, this is this is another uh, really good and, and complicated question. I mean, so I will say that, uh, you know, especially in the pioneering early work from Uri Hassan's group and others, uh, one thing that struck them at the time and, and you know, us as we continue to read this literature and, and do these studies ourselves is that, uh, you know, we don't only see synchrony in primary visual and auditory cortices. You know, we see synchrony in a lot of higher order regions as well. Um, and of course, everything is, is, is connected in reciprocal feed forward and feedback loops. So what's happening in your primary cortex is going to influence what's happening um, in these higher level cortices as well. But I guess taking that on its face, um, the fact that we do see ISC in higher order regions suggests that not all of this is driven by purely low level features and that there is some both shared and idiosyncratic processing happening uh, at higher uh, cognitive and affective levels as well. Um, that being said, I, I think there is a lot of uh, work to be done and a lot of potential in trying to separate out some of these features along different parts of the hierarchy. So um, one thing we've been thinking about and uh, playing around with a little bit is, you know, you could you could have a model where you progressively kind of regress out certain features of the movie that you can measure. So, you know, if we sort of project out the luminance time course and redo ISC, you know, do we get rid of ISC in visual cortex? And then if we project out, you know, a face regressor? Do we get rid of ISC and fusiform? You know, that's sort of a, a simplified way of looking at it, but that could be a prediction. And then 
you can kind of progressively do that until you're left with all the stuff you can't model very well, which is all the stuff we kind of care about probably, which is like the higher level um, uh, cognitive and, and affective time courses. Um, but the, the other, I feel like I've had like four flip sides to this question now, but the other thing I'll say about this too, is if you talk to people in the media world, they actually take a lot of issue with this because if you think about, um, the stimuli that we're using, I mean, these, these are, I call them found stimuli. I mean, these are stimuli that were created for another purpose. They were created to entertain, they were created to inform, you know, the stimuli that we're using that come from Hollywood movies and things like that, which still accounts for the bulk of the work in this domain. Um, when you think about a director, you know, uh, and, and people that actually make movies, they think really carefully about the impact of these so-called low level features that we think of as confounds on your experience of watching the movie. So, you know, if, if a director wants to induce suspense, they're gonna dim the lights, <laughs> you know? If they wanna induce, you know, energy and, and um, you know, kind of uh, make you on the edge of your seat, they're gonna have lots of loud noises and lots of fast moving things in a chase scene, for example. So I, I think it's actually much harder than we might imagine to decouple some of these features. And I, I think there's a danger in sort of, um, you know, reducto ad, ad absurdum, you know, if we sort of, um, we, we need to be careful with how we do this and how we interpret it. Um, I do still think that the presence of features along those different uh, parts of the hierarchy, uh, maybe using different movies where those are sort of orthogonalized to a lesser, more extent, um, can kind of help us abstract away from, you know, very specific low level um, features and, and get at, at some of this higher level stuff. But it's a big open question. Well, as a somewhat of a segue to, to, to this question of, you know, what's lower level, what's higher level, I have to say I was really fascinated by your paranoia study. And, um, you know, what I, how I, where I found myself going with it um, and sort of interpreting um, kind of your findings is that, you know, you, 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 you've created, you, you, you've kind of created this um, set of stimuli, right, where there's, amb it's ambiguous, right, and there's this sort of these ambiguous sort of social situations, and you've got an individual who's listening to them, and who is now going to be creating meaning out of them, and, you know, some individuals are going to be creating a meaning which is, uh, you know, kind of more, quote, unquote, paranoid, others are going to be creating uh, meanings which are sort of more benign, um, and uh, so I, my first is a comment, my second is a question. So my comment is that uh, what your results, uh, where you start looking at, in a sense, um, you know, where, where are the regions in the brain where your, your uh, measure of intrasubject synchrony is, is, dis, you know, is particularly distinct, where it's not distinct versus in the high versus low paranoia. I mean, you're seeing regions both, um, as you say, in your positive and your negative controls where there are, you do not see these group differences or these individual differences. Um, and one of them, including STS, which we know is an important node in processing social information. But what it would suggest is it's a relatively lower node. It's processing social information, whereas now you've got a couple of nodes which are showing these differences where you've got it in, uh, it was left temporal pole and it was, I think, right medial prefrontal cortex. And these nodes are the ones that are distinguishing between sort of the paranoid versus uh, non-paranoid individuals, suggesting that now you've got these higher order nodes where it's got to be meaning or interpretation, right? So you've got an information processing stream in which social information is coming in, and then you've got this sort of higher, higher level networks which are now placing, creating meaning or interpret interpretation, and you're you're beginning to sort of dissect out what some of those might be. And in some ways, that's the heart of what the things we think about in, in psychiatry and in clinical psychology, right? What are the meaning structures that people are 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 developing? So I think that's my first comment. I'd be curious to see if that's that's how you're thinking about it as well. Um, and then my second, uh, which is more of a question, just because I, I didn't catch it if you mentioned it, um, did you show any relationship between, um, uh, say, a level of rating of paranoia, individual levels of rating of paranoia, or could you show it, um, and um, some of the these um, intersubject asynchrony variables? So in other words, is it is it true in which um, in, in which individuals who are showing higher levels of this um, of this uh, synchrony? in these, you know, let's call them a higher order interpretation nodes, are those individuals who are showing the higher tendency to self-report paranoid ideation? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, no, great, great comment and question. Um, to your first point, yeah, I absolutely think that that's a really good way to think about and, and frame these things, um, kind of, you know, where do we start to see people diverge, you know, and, 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 you know, 
perhaps STS is is an important node in the network, but it's a lower node than some, you know, it's sort of perhaps um, we can't conclude this directly from our results, but it could be the case that, you know, SDS is kind of feeding information then to these higher areas. And so, you know, everyone's sort of still synced at the level of SDS, but then, you know, it kind of, it gets further up to the chain and more open to uh, interpretation and mixing with one's own, you know, uh, experience and tendencies. And that's where we start to sort of see the, the divergence. So I think that's a really promising way to frame these things and think about them. Um, and then to your second question, let's see if I can. Oh, it was just it. whether there was a, there's a, whether you, it would be possible to demonstrate a relationship between say degree of, of self-rated paranoid ideation and um, some of the uh, synchrony in these higher order nodes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and just to clarify, so do you mean um, self-reported ideation at a trait level or specifically in response to the story or both? On a trait level, on a trait okay. level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we did actually do, um, we did actually do that uh, sort of in a more continuous way um, because I, one thing I didn't talk about with this story was I sort of violated my own, um, uh, I, you know, I typically shy away from doing median splits in the group level thing. In this case, the statistics were such that it was easier. Um, ISC is kind of a mess statistically because you have all of this interdependence because every data point is not independent. It's a pair of people. Um, so to make a long story short, we started with the median split, but then we did actually go back and, and this was post hoc, you know, um, to be clear, but we did then go back and for these regions that emerged in the group analysis, we looked to see if there was in fact a more continuous relationship with trait paranoia. So here, um, what this is, is zooming in on this left, left temporal pole region. This is an inner subject correlation matrix where, so this is subjects by subjects and the subjects have been ordered by their self-reported trait paranoia. So higher, you know, increasing trait paranoia down and to the right. Um, and it's a little bit messy, but you can kind of start to see this structure emerge where um, pairs of higher uh, paranoia subjects are more synchronized with one another in this region. And, and you can do um, a, a correlation here. So here is, is um, the rank. To, so just within this data set, um, the distribution was a little bit skewed. So we were looking at ranks here. So um, how high people's self-rated paranoia was versus their uh, median ISC with all of the other subjects. And, and uh, it's kind of a course measure. We can kind of think of it like if you are a high paranoia person, then you're going to have higher median ISC because your pairings with other high paranoia people are going to kind of drive up your median. And then um, people that score lower are going to be less similar both to the high people and to one another. So there's sort of this like spreading of variance that happens in, in the low um, group. And so that's kind of what we see here borne out with these, again, post hoc. Um, so the regions were selected because they showed a group difference, but nicely they're also showing uh, this kind of more continuous relationship as well. Uh, and that was true for, for this right medial PFC. Um, and so I, uh, I didn't have time to talk about this today, but I've actually thought a lot about this question too, uh, in terms of how we can model. I think a lot of times when we do group contrasts, you know, we're looking for a difference in means, but there might also be a difference in variability, you know? So if you think about sort of a space, like what this is suggesting, basically, I, I should have put these up here too, but if you do kind of a, a, a spatial embedding of these, these are essentially distance matrices now. And so if you do a sort of two-dimensional embedding of this, what you would see is that there's sort of a cluster of dots corresponding to the high paranoia group. And then there's a spreading around that of the low paranoia people. So it's not that, you know, one group has a stereotyped response and the other group also has a stereotyped response and those responses are just different. It's very much that, you know, one group has a stereotyped response and another group is just sort of, you know, more variable around that. Um, but that doesn't have to be true for every trait we look at. So there might be other traits where there is, you know, a stereotyped response on one end of the spectrum and a different stereotype response on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and so we have to be really careful with how we're modeling this. Um, and I've thought a lot of, about that question. I have another paper on that. Um, it's called idiosynchrony. If <laughs> people are interested, I could talk a lot about that too, but it's a really good point. Um, and looking at more continuous and dimensional things in this way, uh, I think is, is really important because we can be masking a lot of interesting variability if we're only looking at differences in means. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, all right. Well, I think this is a good place for us to pause. Um, Emily, I want to thank you again for an outstanding and thought-provoking presentation. Look forward to seeing your work develop. And, and of course, uh, we have a prejudice for seeing it develop in clinical populations. 
um, uh, look for, looking forward to as you begin to grow your lab and be able to do that work as well. And thank you everyone for attending and for the good questions and, and, and good discussion. Um, so thanks yeah. again. Yeah. Thank you so much. It, it's an honor to, to speak with you all. And um, yeah, stay tuned. Now that I'm in one stable place, I'm hoping to ingratiate myself with people in psychiatry so I can actually start scanning some patients and, and doing some collaborations. Um, yeah. So yeah, thanks again. That'll be great. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. -bye,